in episode four, I told you, I showed you instruments, uh, an English instrument and a Viennese instrument and their actions. They were from about 1790. And so now we arrived at circa 1850. And um, here are a Viennese action and an English action. They're very different, they're very different. But there are a lot of things that changed in the same way. For instance, this is a hammer of a B tone. And if you see here, it works very differently, but the size is very comparable. And now if I compare it to a B key from a Michael Rosenberger piano, you see the difference. And this is from 1800 and this is from 1850. The system didn't change, but everything got very uh, heavy. And also the sound changed very much. Um, in English actions, the hammers uh, move away from you and in the Viennese actions, uh, they come towards you. And that's, that's a system that never changed actually and in the end got very old fashioned. Last film I showed you the Erard action which was really very sophisticated already. And in the end, in the later 19th century, everybody started making these kinds of actions. We arrived at 1850 now. The pianos got very big, the halls got very big. And the pianos had to be, and they had to be very strong in sound. And it, this was possible because also the industrial uh, development of the time. So it was possible to make much thicker strings, much stronger strings. And they needed that because the soundboards got so thick. So uh, to bring this in motion, you need very strong, very thick strings with a lot of tension on it. And here we see a Broadwood of 1854. It's a beautiful, fantastic uh, rosewood piano. And interesting of this piano is that it was made in 1854 and it was kept by Broadwood for about 10 years to use for concerts, so they rented it out. The tensions grew enormously. By this time, a piano like this, the string tension altogether is about 12,000 kilograms, pulling in this direction. So can you imagine that on this pin block here are 10 Volkswagen cars hanging? This kind of weights are we talking about. In Mozart's time, it was only 1,500. It was a very tiny instrument. But by now, we have all this tension. So these huge iron bars are really necessary to withstand this enormous tension. And, and that's something which changes all the time. Because in the last episode, I show you, showed you the Erard piano. And the, and the iron reinforcements are much thinner than here. It really goes very fast in this, in this time. A modern piano has about 20,000 kilograms of tension on it. It's much more than this one. There was a huge development and there was a huge competition between the piano makers in Vienna and in London and in Paris, let's say. And it was not only about the technical aspects. It was also trying to get the pianists play their pianos. I told you in the last episode that Clara Schumann was really uh, in difficulty about what piano to choose. But also Broadwood was very kind to pianists. There's this story that when Chopin came to London in 1848 um, and he wanted to travel on to, um, to Edinburgh, uh, Broadwood uh, paid for his train ticket and the chair on the other side so he could put his legs on the chair and nobody would disturb him. That was very kind of Broadwood. He apparently was a very nice, kind man. The famous uh, Virtuosos traveled through Europe everywhere and they played on the pianos at hand. So probably uh, Viennese pianos were in Italy and in, 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 uh, in Austria, of course, and in Germany and in France, there were the French pianos. And even English piano went, pianos went to America and to India. Um, and, and also they, they were spread all over Europe. When Clara Schumann was in London in 1856, she played a concert in the Queen's uh, concert room and um, is the program. She played on a Broadwood piano, and even the, the program says it. But this is a piano made in 1854, but it was kept by Broadwood to use for rental for concerts. So it's very well possible that she played this very piano.
The general keyboard compass in this period is seven octaves. Most makers make that. This piano only has from CC to A4, which is almost seven octaves. And its counterpart, the Schneider piano, which I'm going to show you now, has seven octaves. This is a Schneider piano. It's made in Vienna. And it is specially made for the first Great World Exhibition in London, in Police Crystal Palace, in 1851. So this, this piano was in London, 1851, in Crystal Palace. It has seven octaves, which is the common compounds for that period. Uh, Johann Baptist Streicher, the famous Viennese maker, was in London, but not with his pianos, he was as a visitor. And as I told you before, this book, Three Generations Streicher, and there's a copy of a letter in it that Streicher writes home complaining terribly about everything. So the acoustic is horrifying. The, the place is very dusty. The, the, the masters come pouring into the building at 11 o'clock. There's never time to tune anything or for maintenance or, or whatsoever. So he's, he's actually quite uh, uh, pissed about it. And, um, but this piano he describes very clearly in this letter. So um, that's very interesting to see because it is also in the catalog of the, of the exhibition, but that he writes about it is much more interesting. He writes about the wonderful inlays. He says it is a bird's eye maple with very elaborate inlays. It has two iron bars into the piano, in the piano. And the inlays are everywhere and the legs and everything. And I must say, I've never seen a Viennese piano of this period in such beautiful, uh, which looks so beautiful. It's so beautifully made. The slightest detail is really magnificent. If I close down the lid, I can show you the, the lock. Even the lock is very beautiful. The original key still there. But look at the shape of this keyhole. And then, of course, you can lock it. Still works. But also, it, it's really kind of clamped into the hole and it cannot rattle. Fantastic. And the inlays are really spectacular. If you look in the detail, tiny pieces of wood, one square millimeter, it's, it's a kind of a predecessor of the pixel. It's incredible how they could make this, and it's specially done for the Great World Exhibition. But for the rest, this is a traditional Viennese piano. It has a Viennese action and Viennese dampers. But the sound is magnificent. It's a very round and very uh, romantic sound. Schneider is not known now, but it must be, uh, he must have been very known in his time because Austria would only have sent their very best, of course. And every tiny detail is magnificent. To put the candles on. It had been in the Colt collection for almost 60 years. He claimed, Colt, that he saw it in a, in a Vogue magazine in 1960. And it was all about a dress. There was a fashion model showing a dress. But he checked down the piano through uh, the editors and he bought it. And since then it was in the Colt collection. I had this idea that if I could find this magazine, I would love to have this photo, of course. And then I had this idea finding the model, if she's still alive, I mean, she, she would be at least 85 or something. And then ask her to stand with the piano again. This would be a wonderful symbol of ephemerality.
Here ends our story of the history of the early piano. We started with the harpsichord 1744 and by now we're at 1850. And that's a great moment to stop because it's 1853 that Bechstein, Blutner and Steinway started their businesses and that's a real new direction in piano history.